It may be fair to say that Henry Hudson is one of the world's most famous explorers. Yet there is much we do not know. Henry Hudson's actual date of birth is not known. It is estimated around 1570, which would have made him around 37 years old when he made his first voyage in 1607. He was married and had three children. He was English, not Dutch. By today's standards, they might be considered middle class and that they could afford to live in a decent dwelling near the Tower of London and even afford a maidservant to help wife Catherine with the three boys, Oliver, John, and Richard. We do know that his name was Henry and not Hendrik, as so often called and emblazoned on the newest and finest steamboat on the Hudson River, and as evidenced in his contract with the Amsterdam directors of the Dutch East India Company. Nothing of certainty is known about his family or parents. There are family trees for Henry Hudson, but many are filled with question marks. What is known is that he could read and write, understood mathematics, and knew how to navigate the stars. There are no authenticated portraits of him. All of the pictures alleged to be likenesses of him were made after his death and come from artists' imaginations. All that is known about Henry Hudson covers five years of his life, from 1607 to 1611. Henry Hudson had one goal. That goal was to find a passage to the Orient and he wasn't the first to try. Many had attempted before him. Europe's population was growing, the economy was changing as well as strained. Food and clothing prices were at an all-time high and food was scarce. People were moving from the countryside to the city. Henry Hudson was on a mission, and he had friends and influences in London to help him get started on his first voyage. It became his passion, and that passion is what probably led to his death. His first of four voyages began on May 1, 1607 as captain of the ship Hopewell. Sponsored by the English Muscovy Company for which it is believed his family had a history and or stake in working for. He had a crew of ten plus himself and his son John. The purpose of the trip was to discover a passage by the North Pole to Japan and China. Incredibly, Hudson and others believed the waters would be warmer because the days were longer near the North Pole. At one point, weather was so bad that he sailed blindly in snow along the coast of Greenland. Ice prevented him from reaching his goal, but a great deal geographically was learned. His report on the number of whales led others to begin whaling in that area. Some writers and historians claim that the whaling boom that followed was a direct result of Henry Hudson's sighting, and that other nations sent expeditions as a result. Other accounts attribute this to explorer Jonas Poole in 1610, and others who followed. Hudson writes in his log, July the 14th, 1607. At noon, being a thick fog, we found ourselves near land, and running farther we found a bay open to the west. The northern side of this bay's mouth is a small island which we called Collins Cape, by the name of our bosun who first saw it. In this bay we saw many whales, and one of our company, having hook and line overboard to try for a fish, a whale came under the keel of our ship and made her held. Yet by God's mercy we had no harm, but the loss of the hook and three parts of the line. In the bottom of this bay, John Coleman, my mate, and William Collin, my bosun, with two others of our company, went on shore, and there they found and brought aboard a pair of morse's teeth in the jaw. They likewise found whale's bones, and some dozen or more deer's horns. They saw the footings of beasts of other sorts. They also saw road geese. They saw much driftwood on the shore, and found a stream or two of fresh water. Here they found it hot on the shore, and drank water to cool their thirst. This night proved clear, and we had the sun on the meridian, on the north and by east parts of the compass. From the upper edge of the horizon with the cross staff, we found its height 10 degrees 40. From a north sun to an east sun, we sailed between north and north-northeast for eight leagues. Whether Henry Hudson or Jonas Poole can be credited with the fine, within a decade the whale and walrus population was depleted. A sad commentary and footnote to the voyage, but at the time this was seen as the highlight of the trip, and if it was Hudson that got the credit, it is what helped him to be able to make the second voyage after failing in the first. On September 15th, after three and a half months away, they pulled back into port. The 
The second voyage begins eight months later on Friday, April 22, 1608, again sailing for the Muscovy Company on the Hopewell. This time Hudson is in search of a northeast passage going above Novae Zemblie, an island above Russia. His crew totals 13, including Sun John. Hudson demands additional men and that the ship be reinforced. Robert Jewett joins the crew and is older than Hudson, literate, and an able seaman. But Jewett also becomes part of the problem. Hudson himself describes Jewett as a man filled with mean tempers. It is believed that Robert Jewett kept the log on a second voyage as he did on a third. But when pieces of Hudson's journal were printed in 1625, Jewett's was not. The belief being in the interest of brevity. But if that was really the case, we will never know as Jewett's log was never found. An investigation in 1841 by the New York State Legislature also turned up nothing more. Near the end of June, they reached the island of Novae Zemblie above Russia, but ice prevented them from going further. They did some exploration and finding not only signs of many walrus, deer, bear, and birds, they also find pieces of a broken cross, indicating they were not the first to pass this way. The ship ran into snow and gales, and Hudson writes in his log, June 9th, 1608. In latitude 75 degrees 29, we entered into ice, being the first we saw in this voyage. Our hope was to go through it. We held our course between northeast and east northeast until four in the afternoon, at which time we were so far in and the ice so thick and firm ahead that we had endangered us. We returned the way we had entered with a few rubs of our ship against the ice. During the second voyage and documented in Hudson's own hand was the Mermaid incident on June 15, 1608. This morning, one of our company looking overboard saw a mermaid and calling up some of the company to see her, one more came up and by that time she was come close to the ship's side looking earnestly on the men. A little after, a sea came and overturned her. From the navel upwards, her back and breast were like a woman's, as they say that saw her, but her body as big as one of us her skin very white, and long hair hanging down behind of color black. In her going down, they saw her tail, which was like the tail of a porpoise, and speckled like a mackerel. Their names that saw her were Thomas Hills and Robert Rayner. It's been suggested that this mermaid was a seal, or perhaps just a faulty observation. But one has to wonder why did he give the names of witnesses. Hudson decides to sail to North America, there were weeks of rain and the crew had had enough. In his log, Hudson hints at a mutiny rising and decides it's best not to waste time getting back to England. And on August 26, 1608, he returns. The Muscovy Company directors are none too pleased. Henry Hudson is now without a ship or employment. Hudson's third voyage was for the Dutch East India Company on the Half Moon. He had fallen out of favor with the Muscovy Company after the last voyage. The French also wanted to hire Hudson, but the Dutch, who were initially stalling, jumped at the chance when they heard the French wanted to employ his services. While Hudson was negotiating a strict contract with the Dutch to sail back over Novae Zemblie, he received a package from his friend and famous Jamestown settler, Captain John Smith stating the belief that a passage to the west lay to the north through America. He sent Hudson some maps given to him by the natives which later proved to include the Great Lakes. As they head toward Novae Zemblie, it was frozen over and the men were freezing. Hudson propositioned the men to sail to America, speculation that he used the information provided to him by Captain John Smith. The other option was to sail through Davis Straits which would provide no further comfort or warmth. They headed for America. Through the rest of May, June, July, and August, the crew of the Half Moon sailed along charting the coastline and at different points stop and trade with the natives. They also had several altercations, particularly on July 25th, where Robert Jewett writes in his log, The 5 and 20th, very fair weather and hot. In the morning, we manned our scoop with four muskets and six men and took one of their shallops and brought it aboard. Then we manned our boat and scoop with 12 men in muskets, two more stone pieces or motors, and drew the savages from their houses, as they would have done of us. This seems to be his justification. What is troublesome is that it appears that Hudson does nothing. Perhaps he even condones it. 
What we now know is that in September of 1609, Henry Hudson and his crew entered New York Bay in the now named Hudson River with the ultimate goal of finding a passage west. Although Hudson's discovery can be disputed, including Veranzano's log of 1524 describing entering the mouth of the bay, an earlier map showing the Hudson River, including the 1569 New France Mercator map, showing a fort near what is now Albany, what cannot be disputed is that to this point in time no one had clearly documented the river, its beauty, its natural resources, or the Native American life from where its mouth empties into the sea to where their small ship could go no further. The trip up and down the river was full of excitement and surprises that reads like an adventure novel. It was not without misfortune, and it was not without altercation and violence with the natives. Scholars to this day still debate the logs. They anchor near what is now Albany on the 19th of September. They trade with the natives. Then on the 20th, the small boat is sent out with several crew and they return at night with measurements for the river ahead. It confirms they can go no further. Hudson now realizes at this point his quest is over. On the 23rd, the ship is turned around and they start to head back down the river. While making their way down the river, they have several more encounters with the natives, both good and bad. What remains of Hudson's log entries describe this new world as pleasant to land as one can tread on. He tells of visiting with the natives and of being treated well by them. Robert Jewett's log has a different perspective, stating more than once, but we durst not trust them. On October 29th, it is generally agreed that they anchored in Newburgh Bay. Robert Jewett writes in his journal on the 29th, the 9 and 20th was dry close weather. The wind at south and south by west. We weighed early in the morning and turned down three leagues by a low water and anchored at the lower end of the long reach for it's six leagues long. Then there came certain Indians in a canoe to us but would not come aboard. After dinner there came the canoe with other men whereof three came aboard us. They brought Indian wheat which we bought for trifles. At three of the clock in the afternoon we weighed as soon as the ebb came and turned down to the edge of the mountains or the northernmost of the mountains and anchored because the island hath many points and a narrow channel and hath many eddy winds. So we rode quietly all night in seven fathoms of water. They stop and trade with the natives along the way down and on the 30th the half moon anchors near Peekskill which although historians differ Many believe this is the location that is referred to as a very pleasant place to build the town on. On the 2nd of October, they are ambushed by approximately 100 natives, including one of them that they had held captive after an earlier altercation. Arrows are shot at the half moon and the natives try to board, but none of the crew were hit. Hudson orders the guns to be fired and several natives are killed. The ship heads for the mouth of the river and then for Europe. The trip takes a month to return after being away for seven and a half months. Robert Jewett records in his journal. October the 5th, 1609. We continued our course toward England without seeing any land by the way. All the rest of this month of October. And on the seventh day of November being Saturday, by the grace of God, we arrived safely in the range of Dartmouth in Devonshire. What is interesting is they return to England, not Amsterdam. The ship is seized as are the logs and Henry Hudson is arrested for treason and put under house arrest for sailing for another country. Henry Hudson did not find his passage, but the new world was about to change forever. Henry Hudson's fourth voyage began in April of 1610, once again in search of a northwest passage and surprisingly sailing for England after his house arrest. He kept the journal but only pieces survived, the rest probably being destroyed by the mutinous crew. After sailing towards Greenland and then across Davis Strait, he turns into the bay which now carries his name. In late June they ran into ice, by November, and after a number of issues with the crew including jealousy, disobedience, scurvy, and freezing cold, a decision needed to be made whether to turn around and give up seeking the Northwest Passage or wait out the winter. 
They would need to build shelter, hunt and fish, get firewood, and hope that the natives are not hostile. They would need to ground the ship to relieve the pressure on the hull so ice doesn't crack it. One crew member had already died. Henry Hudson decides that they will stay and move on in the spring, a decision that will cost him his life. On July 12, 1611, after a long and arduous winter, they were once again ready to sail. Hudson had made some changes in the crew which did not go over well. They again get stuck in the ice and on June 20th, Hudson turns the ship west but the crew wants to return. Provisions are running low and he orders a search of the ship and divides the remaining food, including that which is spoiled, but some feel cheated. On June 21st, things go very bad. The only account of the mutiny written by passenger Abacuc Prickett is disputed by all who have studied his account, but it is the only account that we have. What is certain is that Henry Hudson, his son John, and seven other men never returned. Of the twelve remaining men, four died on the way home, including three responsible for the mutiny, including Robert Jewett. Justice served, perhaps. Although the remaining crew was questioned and recommended to hang, the trial did not officially take place until 1618, and several had already passed and some believe the sentence was never carried out. There are those that also believe that Hudson's voyage and the reason he was allowed to sail for England again after his arrest upon his return from his third voyage and sailing for the Dutch was a secret mission to search for gold and treasure for England. From 1607 to 1611, Henry Hudson made four attempts to find a passage to the Far East. Each failed to meet their goal. Like other men and women, and Robert Fulton, he was driven by a passion to succeed at no matter what the cost. During his four voyages, there were at least three attempted mutinies, probably four. The last mutiny put him, his son, and seven others adrift in the icy waters of James Bay. He sailed on three different ships during four voyages. All three ships were subsequently sunk or captured after having gone on and sailed by other captains. There is little doubt that he was not the first to enter the river and bay at New York Harbor. Yet Henry Hudson was a sought-after captain, has more bodies of water named after him, and is carved in history, book, stone, and song. Stay. 
God. 